My name is Melissa Chan. Thanks for joining us. This fireside chat is titled Building Healthier Digital Ecosystems for Women's Political Participation. Moira Whalen, Director for Democracy and Technology at the National Democratic Institute, will be facilitating this chat. NDI works to promote openness and accountability in government by building political and civic organizations, safeguarding elections, and promoting citizen participation. Before her time at NDI, Moira was Deputy Assistant Secretary for Digital Strategy at the U.S. State Department. Enjoy the discussion. everybody and thanks for joining us uh, to a conversation about women's political participation and the consequences of harassment. And before we get started today and I introduce our fantastic panelists, I just wanted to express my thanks to Access Now but especially also to DFR Lab who is co-sponsoring uh, this panel in particular. And what we're going to do today is we're going to walk through a short introduction, I'll open the conversation to our participants, and then we're happy to take your questions online. Um, so just to get us started, I first wanted to acknowledge that this panel is really a representation of a lot of the incredible work that's been going on in our community for a really long time. And I would point to organizations that we've worked with, such as Danish Church Aid, Internews, Policy, um, and many, many others. Here at RightsCon, there are more than 30 sessions happening to address these issues of online violence against women in politics. And, uh, you know, so, so first acknowledging that others are doing the work, and in saying that, some of the organizations that we work with, and, and I think an expectation we now have, is that if we're doing this work, we face that harassment and that abuse as a community and as an organization. And that goes along with including the organizations that have helped organize this panel. Um, so first, I want to uh, say a little bit about NDI and how we came to this work. NDI is a democracy organization that trains women around the world to help them run for office, help them prepare for their life in, in civil society in the public sphere. And this issue has become blinking red for us. The number of women who are self-censoring, who are pulling out of politics, who are deciding another path, is, is probably the biggest threat to democracy that we face today. So we really started down the path of using our traditional models of working on information, on the information space and bringing actors together to address this issue. Um, but we also believe it's a solvable problem. And I want to note that part of what we're talking about today and the reason we've talked about building the community we want to build with our guests is because we want to talk about solutions, but also some of the setbacks. So without further ado, our panelists are uh, Julian Mangrant, who is the e-safety commissioner of Australia, and also Tracy Chow, who is the founder of Block Party and also an entrepreneur, and um, is, is, we're really thrilled to have her, as well as Fernanda Martins, who is the director at Internet Lab, and finally, Nima Lugangera, who is a member of parliament from Tanzania. So welcome all of you. And Nima, I want to start with you. The thing that we have noticed in doing this work is that it's very rare for active female politicians to speak up because you don't want to make, to use your words, this, this is not the agenda, right? You have other issues as a parliamentarian you want to address. So I wonder if you can walk us through your personal experience of being so outspoken on the harassment you face and also what that's done for your political experience. Um, thank you very much. I first want to sincerely thank yourself, Moira, and NDI Tech for facilitating and enabling me to be here at RightsCon, so thank you once again. Um, as you rightly said, that being a female in politics, unfortunately, the more outspoken you are, the more popular you are and well-known, the more abuse you get. And oftentimes you find on social media platforms, the abuse that we tend to get, it's a group of people who want to disqualify you, discredit you, belittle you. So instead of focusing on the issue that you're presenting, instead of focusing on the agenda, 
they shift the issue and start focusing on the gender. And unfortunately, being a female politician, what they do is they sexualize the issue. So they will sexualize everything that you've presented. If it's a photo, they'll sexualize that. If you happen to take a photo with a guy in a meeting, they'll probably change the backgrounds. So just to shift the narrative and to kind of belittle you and kind of shut you up. And what that, what that has done is, unfortunately, in Africa, and I believe it's probably the same even in the global north, is that the number of women in politics or female members of parliament who are active online is very, very minimal. For example, in Tanzania, we have about 146 female MPs and probably less than 5% are active on social media, using social media for the work. And what that does, what that does very quickly it has a huge detrimental effect because one, it limits our own visibility. And if you're not visible as a politician, it limits your own re-election, but it also takes a step back. You know, organizations like NDI are making strides to increase the number of women in politics. But young women, aspiring women, they see us women in politics who are supposedly in power, but we are being abused and we are helpless. And nobody comes to the defense of women in politics. Like, I've seen it over and over again, when a female in politics is being abused, nobody comes to their defense. Actually, more people, mob attack. It's almost, it comes, it comes kind of with a, uh, with a territory. And just to sum up, I decided that since we're a group that nobody speaks for us, so I'm gonna speak for members of parliament, I'm gonna speak for women in politics, and as a result of that, yes, it brings about more abuse, but then some of us have to go through it so that we can address this issue, because I wanna see more women in politics visible so that we can strengthen the visibility, because we are doing a lot of incredible work and it needs to be seen. I couldn't agree with you more. And I think, quickly, I wanna shift to you, Julie, because I, you know there is that issue of full participation, and it's something you've really focused on at eSafety in Australia, and getting to sort of moving us from the research that we've worked on to the solutions. I wonder if you can walk everyone through here this sort of example of addressing some of the concerns that Nima has raised uh, in Australia. You who don't know uh, what an e-safety commissioner is, we're the first uh, national independent regulator for online harms and online safety, and we were established in 2015. And so there is an online safety act that en enables me to take action when um, Australians report all forms of abuse to social media platforms, gaming sites, dating sites, you name it, and it isn't taken down. So we serve as that safety net to advocate on behalf of our um, citizens when things go wrong online. Uh, we know tons fall through the cracks, um, and so we can bridge that inherent power balance that exists. So I deal with everything from child sexual exploitation to image-based abuse, the non-consensual sharing of intimate images and videos. And I can say that um, recently we've been getting reports of deep fake videos of female politicians and other prominent women. Uh, we have a cyberbullying scheme for youth and an adult cyber abuse scheme, which is at a much higher threshold to make sure that freedom of expression isn't um, undermined, but we all realize here that targeted misogynistic abuse is designed to silence voices. And as you say, um, women will self-censor. Um, now, we, beyond these laws, we focus on prevention in the first instance, protection through these regulatory schemes, and then what I call proactive change. So part of that has to do with putting the responsibility back on the platforms themselves through initiatives like Safety by Design, um, you know, AI is a perfect use case as to how these, the collective brilliance of the technology industry should be used to start um, tackling this at scale and preventing hateful and misogynistic and homophobic uh, content from being uh, shared. So on the prevention side, um, well, first of all, I should say, all of these forms of abuse are gendered. 96% of the child sexual abuse material we look at, which happens sorry to say, at toddler age, 96% are of girls. 85% of our image-based abuse um, are from women and girls. Um, and then when you get more to the pointy end, um, we know that 99% of women experiencing domestic and family violence are also experiencing an extension of that abuse. 
uh, through technology facilitated abuse in 99.3% of cases. So 89% of our adult cyber abuse cases are from women and many of whom are, are either being cyber stalked and doxxed as an extension of um, domestic and family violence or by perpetrators who specifically target women. And as Nina, Nina said, um, the way that online abuse against women manifests is different than uh, versus men. It's sexualized, it's violent, it talks about rape, fertility, supposed virtue, um, and appearance. It just manifests in very, very different ways. So I've had so many politicians say to me, you know, the ma their male counterparts will say, well, just toughen up, sweetheart, this is politics. Well, it is different. So I actually tried to start a program called Women in the Spotlight to provide social media self-defense to women politicians, to journalists, to anyone in the public eye. And I was told by a previous government, uh, we can't fund that. That's protecting privileged women. <laughs> so I, I set up the program anyway and started to do the training. And um, we can't keep up with demand for social media um, self-defense training. And I don't need to tell any of you that um, if being a woman uh, receiving misogynistic abuse isn't enough, if you're from, um, you have a disability, you, end up, you identify as LGBTQI+, um, or you're from a diverse background, that kind of abuse is compounded. So um, again, I think we'll continue to persevere. Um, we need these prevention um, programs. Um, we also know that the average professional woman in Australia is receiving online abuse. So one in three women and 25% of them won't take um, a job opportunity or a promotion if it requires them to be online. So we're starting to see normalization of this kind of abuse across the population. And this is why I'm trying to use my powers um, much more strongly to send a message that we cannot abuse people with total impunity. Um, and this also involves um, penalties and fines for perpetrators as well as the platforms themselves that refuse to um, remove content. We always try and work informally first, uh, but I, I, do, I have used my formal powers. And if, if platforms don't comply, um, I can take them to court and define them as well. Well, and we are going to wing our way to Silicon Valley when we get to Tracy, but I wanted to stop in Brazil first and give Fernanda a chance because I think one of the things you said, Julie, was really about the intersectional issues as well that are linked to this, um, but also the successes that you've had as civil society at Internet Lab, first having to prove to governments that this is a problem, second getting them to pay attention and to work through the process. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your involvement working with the government of Brazil. Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you, Moira, for this question, and thank you, DFR Lab, for organizing it. Um, I think in Internet Lab, we have been working to improve the way that political gender-based violence is, uh, is treated by governments, uh, independent of the government at the moment. So at this moment, also, uh, it's different because we have a progressist government, but at the same time we have parliamentaries that is not uh, defensors of human rights. So the context is a fragile democracy yet, so we have this uh, challenge to understand how we can contribute to this issue in Brazil. So at this moment we have uh, the fake news uh, bill to uh, try uh, to address the problems related to platforms, but it is important to mention that in the bill don't have any mention to gender, any mention to LGBTQAI plus community, and uh, a brief note about the law, um, political violence law, and the racism law in Brazil, but it's like we are running in parallel avenues. It's not connected. So uh, we are trying to 
talk to government, talk to private sector, and understand how we can uh, mix it, different social sectors to uh, address the problem. And I think we have the law approved in 2020 um, addressing political violence, but uh, we studied the enforcement of the law in the last election, and it was really weak. We need to uh, just expand more the comprehension and not focus only on uh, penal uh, answers. We need education and other things in this context. Well, I think that's really important, especially as Julie was talking about so much the value of implementation and needing to see that it's not just legal frameworks that are going to get us there. But all of you have talked about the platforms. All of you have talked about tech. And I want to turn to Tracy now because I do have to tell you a story. Tracy was with us uh, when DFR Lab hosted us in Brussels to really introduce this issue and to really put it on the, the center stage, literally. Um, and we're big fans of Black Party. But Tracy, we have a different panel here today. So we were here celebrating the success of Black Party, but I think you should maybe tell us about the current status. Yes. So, hi everyone, I'm Tracy. I'm the founder and CEO of Block Party. We build technology to fight harassment online and make the internet safe for everyone. Until last week, our flagship product was available on Twitter to combat harassment. Um, and it is now sadly on hiatus, thanks to platform changes. Before we get into that, maybe some context. Um, I started my career as an early engineer at social media companies that are now very big platforms, so Facebook, Pinterest, and Quora. Um, so I kind of understand how platforms are built and what are their incentives, not just at the high level, the KPIs for the companies, but also for individual people working at those companies. And separately, I became an activist for diversity, equity, and inclusion in the tech industry, seeing how the people that are in the room really matter for the products that we're building. That led to me getting a lot of harassment. And so I set out to solve that problem, blending together the different parts of my experience. Um, so there's the work experience, actually building platforms, and then there's a the personal experience of dealing with harassment. Uh, so what we built on top of Twitter was something to solve my own problem, essentially a sort of fan folder where you can choose who you want to hear from. Um, Everything gets filtered into that folder that you don't, you might not want to see, and you can review it later and take action later, involve your community for help. Um, and it, it worked really well. Like it was great for me. Um, Silicon Valley talks about dog fooding your own products, like building things that you use um, yourself. And it was great for me um, to just experience the, the mental health impact of not having to see all that terrible stuff. Um, it's not just me, it's a lot of other folks that we've already heard from on this panel, people who are working in politics, people who are activists, academics. Um, it's been really sad to see that we've had to shut down or hopefully just put on hiatus. We're really hopeful that we can bring it back in some capacity in the future. Um, we're already seeing the outpouring of folks who are using our product on Twitter. Really sad to see it go. And there's people who are tweeting every day now saying like, I miss Blog Party literally every day because I'm now getting all this harassment that is no longer filtered. Um, so lots more to share on that. Well, Tracy, uh, that I'm gonna, is the current status. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stay with you for a second because you should know that here in this room, I have heard repeatedly people saying they miss Block Party. We wish you could be here with us so that you could feel it directly, but we're sending it to you virtually um, because we need products like this. And I think the other aspect of this story that we would love if, if you could if you can share it, if you can channel your rage into, into helping this room um, help you, you're an entrepreneur. You've, you've been building and yet, and it should be very obvious to all of us, the business case for creating safe spaces for all people to fully participate online. And yet your experience in Silicon Valley has been decidedly different. And I wonder if you can just kind of give us an insight into the experience of 
going with your fundraising rounds and when you walked into rooms with, with funders, because I think people here need to know just how challenging the environment is from beginning to end. It's not just about exist fixing the existing big giant platforms. We have a fundamental challenge mm -hmm. here. Yeah, first I might back up a little bit and talk about the decision to create Block Party as a for-profit entity. And that was because I believe that there is a business case and also that in order to align the incentives, going for a capitalist approach, which is building solutions for people who pay for the value that they're getting is the best way. In order to build really compelling technology as well, to be able to hire the best people in technology for design and product and engineering also requires being able to pay those salaries. And so VC money, venture capital money made the most sense to me as aligning all of those things together. There's a big opportunity there and we need that initial capital to get going to build the technology. So when I went out to raise, I felt like, you know, I have like a pretty good shot at making this case. I'm a technical founder with deep experience from top companies. I have two engineering degrees from Stanford where I graduated with top honors. Like this is a good resume that Silicon Valley typically likes. I'm solving my own problem, which they also talk about as a great thing. Like if you know the problem intimately because you experience it, then you're very motivated to solve it and you know all the ins and outs of it. Again, usually something that's very positive. I did not have a good experience. There were a lot of people who are skeptical. Um, you might imagine the typical demographics of VC, very white, very male. People were dubious that there was a market. Um, so I was told that this is very niche and also that it's already a solved problem uh, and it'll be solved by machine learning. The platforms are already addressing it, so like no issues anymore. Um, I suspect some of this has to do with the fact that there's a lack of diversity in the VC industry and even though our products are for everyone, they do disproportionately serve women and people from marginalized communities who are more targeted by abuse. Um, I think there's also the latent sexism in there where even the people who thought that there might be a market here told me that they didn't think that I could solve it, which is very frustrating. Um, by comparison, I saw a number of men uh, trying to tackle the same problem fewer credentials, building poor copycats of my product raise exorbitant sums of money, in some cases, 10 times as much. I talked to some of these founders and they would say things like, oh, well, it's just because like I used to work at Google and so you know, I had the credibility. And I would just have to call myself and say, well, I worked at Google and Facebook and Pinterest and Quora and also have engineering degrees, but I guess that doesn't matter when I'm a woman. Um, so. Very frustrating experience, had to power through that. Ultimately did raise money, so very glad that I was able to raise the seed round last year and can't actually hire people to keep tackling these problems. But I guess to the point that Maura is trying to um, draw out here, there are really systemic issues. If we want to be able to solve these problems, we also need the funding to be able to do so. And when there's systemic biases in the funders and they don't believe that there's a problem here, we're going to have additional challenges in trying to create these solutions. Well. Thank you for that, Tracy. And I can't say again, you know, when we talk about the thing we've all been told of putting on a thicker skin, um, really, does it get any thicker than Tracy's having walked through that? Um, and Julie, I want to talk about these systemic issues, right? We actually had a question come in um, on Slido, so please all participate. But it gets to the next question I wanted to ask you, which was around the barriers. And is one of the barriers freedom of expression and where we allow freedom of expression and what is abuse? And I think you're, you know, you're at the forefront of like how we define that, that digital experience for people and I wonder if you can talk a, a little bit about is that a barrier and and then my second part is why aren't more countries doing what Australia is doing and and how do we help them <laughs> uh, no that's thank you so much and I want to thank Tracy for her perseverance um, I've been watching her journey from afar um, all this stuff about funding and tech Rose, and this just shows you how gender inequality can manifest in so many different ways and at so many different levels and we have to support technologists and entrepreneurs like Tracy to create building these incredible products because I can say having worked at Microsoft and Twitter and and Adobe 
that not enough is doing uh, being done inside and safety is always an afterthought. I mean, even if you look at the patterns of layoffs happening at companies like uh, Twitter and Meta and Microsoft, that the trust and safety people go first. But I guess one thing that we have learned is that we'll never regulate or rest, rest our way out of online harms with the speed, the scale, and the volume of content online. It's always going to be a game of whack-a-mole, I guess, or whack-a-troll, um, if you will. Um, but you're also talking about um, fundamental human behavior and societal ills that lurk underneath. And that was my experience at Twitter. I joined right after the Arab Spring with the belief that it was going to be a great leveler and people would be able to speak truth to power. But what I started to see very clearly is that women and those from marginalized communities were being silenced. So if you don't draw a line about what constitutes online hate and online harm and you allow it to fester, um, then you're actually suppressing freedom of expression. So it's it's a difficult it's a difficult line to tread. Our parliament and in Australia, uh, online safety is very bipartisan, um, and there are different approaches uh, that, of course, different parties would want to take. But but collectively, the government decided that they wanted to draw a line, and if online speech turns into online invective and is designed with the serious intent to harm, to menace or harass, that we would draw a line and that we would have um, an investigative process, uh, that there'd be lots of transparency and accountability and multiple ways to challenge any decision I make. That's the right thing. Never been challenged uh, by any decision. Um, and we're actually helping to remediate harm of individuals. So the good news is there are more countries coming on board with online harms regulators. Um, Ireland um, and Fiji both have online safety commissioners now. Of course, the online safety bill in the UK is pending. Um, that, that again is a much more polarized debate. Canada's looking at this. Um, I, I'm not sure where we'll get to in the, the, the US, but we do want tech companies to start stepping up and protecting, empowering, and supporting people online. And that's why five years ago, we started the Safety by Design initiative within an industry um, to ask them to start providing the tools to do just that, to think about the design process, the deployment, the development process, the maintenance and the refresh process, rather than retrofitting safety protections after um, the uh, the damage has been done, there will always be room for specialist um, tools like Block Party and Private Party. And we want to facilitate that, you know, let thousands of innovative flowers bloom so that we can all have safer, more positive experiences online. We also have to keep an eye on the future. Um, very concerned about the power of generative AI um, and these um, large language models and, and uh, you know, conversational models with the ability to manipulate, um, to manip manipulate young people for extortion, for grooming, um, for um, you know, deep fakes and um, misinformation and disinformation. Uh, we need to think about immersive technologies in the metaverse. When we're, you know, in in high sensory, hyper realistic environments, the online harassment we're feeling now will be much more extreme and much more visceral. Um, think about with haptics and uh, headsets that are picking up, you know, your retinal scans and flushing. Um, what that technology can tell these major um, companies about you, um, neurotechnology, you bring that into um, the toxic mix. If we don't start putting the onus back on these technology companies to be thinking about at the risks and how their technologies can be misused, um, and have them doing this at the forefront, we're never gonna be able to get ahead of this. So uh, I do hope that more governments come on board. We've just established a global online safety regulators network um, with members who are independent um, statutory authorities who can demonstrate a track record on human rights um, and independence, but we're also making room for observers for governments and other uh, organizations that want to consider um, best practice in terms of setting up online harms regulators. And with the DSA and other um, developments, I expect in the next five or 10 years, we'll, we will have a network of online harms regulators and 
we will no longer in Australia feeling like we're at the head of the peloton going up Mount Ventu with no one drafting behind us. Um, it, I, I think governments need to get together with the civil society sector and start to counter the stealth, the wealth, and the power of the technology industry. That's the only way we're going to get ahead of this. Well, and I couldn't agree more. And I, I should say, I think we all want to live in Julian Mingrant's internet. Um, you know, that's that's definitely the, the space we want to go. I'd also point to the global partnership that Australia, the United States, and others have founded to address online abuse that NDI is very happy to support, and we like the direction it's going. But I think you made one really important point, and that was the really clear leadership of civil society in both identifying this issue, making it a, a, a global issue instead of a, a personal issue that each politician is facing. Um, and you had, Fernanda, talked a little bit about the barriers you were facing. Um, so, so you talked about tech versus government. And I wonder if you can expand on that a little bit and tell us, like, where do you spend your time? How do you, how do you prioritize both of those needs? And who needs to change first? Who needs to change in what way to, to you know, this is what civil society does. You put yourself in the middle and you change it. Please tell us a little bit more about how you're doing that in Brazil. Yeah, sure. Um, it was great to hear from Julie because I was thinking in similar things here. And we know we live at this moment a shift of violence concept. And in last years ago, when we talked to platforms about gender-based violence online, we are talking uh, mainly about uh, dissemination of non-consent non -consent, uh, intimate maids of women. And now, when we try to talk about political violence, is it's like we are tension the relationship between freedom expression and um, and the, the limit that need to exist. So uh, it's interesting to note that when we look at the Brazilian context in the legislative context, we have some laws directed to domestic violence. And when we talk to platforms, they uh, told us about the, uh, the necessity to protect women related to these issues uh, and violence that is targeted by ex-partners, for example. But it's difficult, it is a challenge um, made government made platforms and everyone involved in this issue that we are in public sphere. And not just women, we are talking to marginalized groups in general. So our uh, effort at this moment is to demonstrate that, okay, we demonstrated uh, before that the violence exists. So now what we can do inclusively when we talk about differentiate what needs to be excluded in platforms, what to be um, have a, a flag that there is a content here. It is an insult, but we have um, we have still platforms that have the the policy that uh, public figures need to be more tolerant to uh, attacks and insult as the Meta's platform. So how we can um, educate society in general if you if the example on platforms is the women candidate could be attacked the other could be attacked women LGBTQI plus community so we need to change the policies and we need to uh, we need to strong uh, made strong our laws and the relationship globally so I think it is a little what we try to do. And I think it's, it's an excellent point. Um, when you were working with NDI and our program to, to identify interventions, we identified 26. We have co colleagues at Web Foundation, at CG, at other places that were coming up with theirs. We just did an inventory and we have like 450 identified opportunities for changes. But I want to turn it to Nima because it all comes back to politics. Right? A lot of those changes 
weren't just with platforms, they weren't just with governments, they were also within political parties, how media outlets, you know, cover it. Because even though we're talking about these major global issues, as a politician, that's still a very personal experience, and it's still very, you know, it's hard to look at fixing the whole tech system when you're going through this every day. And I wonder if you can talk about, bring us a little closer to home and, and what we need to do and what are the barriers getting in the way of fixing it for your own political experience. Um, thank you. I think one of the things, there are different moving blocks. First one is the social media platforms. And exactly like what um, she just said, in the sense that it is expected, because we're in politics, we should have thick skin. But why should I have thick skin? Why should I tolerate abuse? If you're not able to abuse me online, why should you abuse, if you're not able to abuse me offline, why should you abuse me online? So the challenges on the social media platforms is although Julie said uh, a positive feedback on AI, at the same time, artificial intelligence also has an issue in the sense that we have, myself and my colleagues, we have reported on a number of times, you report an abuse, and it's written in Kiswahili, for example, or the local language, and you try to even go further and translate it, but still, someone replies and says, this doesn't violate our rules. And you're thinking, what rules? This violates every kind of rule. So on the social media platforms, there's a lot of work that needs to be done. And I think one of the things through organizations like NDI is to give us the opportunity also as the women in politics to be in the same room with the decision makers at the social media platforms. Because we need to tell them these issues and they need to hear these issues from us. Not from someone else, but they need to hear these issues from us. Secondly, when it comes to media, in a lot of countries, unfortunately, media, the way the media do the gender profiling of women in politics also results into abuse. You may find that uh, maybe you've been in a meeting, there were several pictures that, they were that a, a particular media took of you, and they decide to use the picture that shows some parts of the body accidentally. You know, maybe your dress went a little bit down, so your shoulder is showing or the cleavage is showing, and they would use that picture and say, uh, maybe Honorable Nima said such and such, such a brilliant thing, but because the image they chose to use, it totally shifts the issue and it results into abuse. So sometimes the gender profiling is also an issue. But the other thing that I'm currently working on in Tanzania is to try and see, there are a lot of laws that are existing that talk about bits and pieces of online abuse but none are more like specific for women in politics. So I'm trying right now in Tanzania to push that we should have a regulatory reform on our political parties act and election acts so that these two acts recognize online abuse as an offense because there's a number of, of offenses in political parties acts whereby if you can be proven, let's say you're a male and you, are, you, you have you're vying for a position. If, if it can be proven you've done an, a GBV offense, you can be taken off the candidate list. So I'm trying to push that online abuse should also be recognized for women in politics. Because a lot of the abuse that we get is also related to politics. So that can also reduce a certain group, a group of people, at least those who are aspiring to get into politics. And it can give us the power to now start documenting documenting this is, and if you hear uh, maybe, I don't know, Gregory has been nominated for something, you can go and use that particular law and say this person has been abusing women online, kind of thing. So trying to push the Political Parties Act and the Election Act to do so. But at the same time, um, I set up an NGO called Omuka Hub, and what we're trying to do is to strengthen online visibility of women in politics. And continentally, we're trying to do that through the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Again, to strengthen uh, the visibility of women in politics. But to do that, organizations that have funding or that are talking about digital development, digital gender gaps, oftentimes they don't remember that there's a group of women in politics. So I would like to stress that whenever we're having interventions, we should have uh, funding also allocated to support the training and the capacity, exactly like what Ju Julie said. A lot of us are online, but we don't know how to, to protect ourselves. Uh, very recently, I experienced the most horrific abuse through WhatsApp. Like, I've, 
I've, I've experienced it a lot on other platforms, but it was the first time experiencing it in WhatsApp. So these are people I know in a WhatsApp group, and it went on for like four days. I didn't want to leave the group because I didn't want to be seen like I'm running away, but I didn't want to be seeing them. Yeah. And you can't help it because they're there. And I actually got to learn that you can archive the group so you don't see it. I just learned this like two weeks ago. So that can tell you. But that was about like three or four days of cruciating, like emotional, uh, uh, emotional rage. And you can't do anything about it. You want to respond, but people are calling you. You know you're an MP, don't respond, so you're keeping quiet. At the same time, you have to show up in parliament, do your contributions, you have to show up face and do all of that. But why should I be doing that? Why should I have to do that? You know? I, absolutely. I want to uh, back up to one thing. We're going to get two things. We have like less than five minutes, and I want us to do two things. One, we got a question from online, and I think one of the things we really tried to do here was show the completely different environments that we're dealing with, right? We have Australia, we have Brazil, we have Tanzania. Um, and we got a question asking, we've all cited social media regulation as an opportunity here, but that's a, that's a challenge, right? How do you regulate social media from all different perspectives and from all different countries, rec recognizing cultural challenges, recognizing the responsibilities they have to localized platforms. So I don't know who wants it, who wants to pick up on the, on the regulation, uh, maybe Julie and Nima quickly. And then after that, what we're gonna do is you have a captive audience. We have the entire digital rights community here. We need to send them out with something to do. We're all good at that. We're gonna give them a job. So be thinking quickly about what your job is for everyone in this room. But Nima and then Julie, and then we can kind of go on. Um, so very quickly in terms of the re regulation, I think one, one is we, we cannot avoid regulating social media. But the issue is how to regulate, because you still want the environment. You, you, you don't want it to be stringent. And we can learn from other countries who have done it. But the bottom line is, especially for Global South countries, who don't have that muscle that Global North have, what I would like to say is when Global North are negotiating with social media companies, are, are getting into agreements, they should insert requirements that the same behavior they do in their block, in the EU or the US, Canada, Australia, they should also behave the same way in Africa. We're seeing the same thing with um, data protection. Yeah. They're doing a great job in the EU, horrible job in Africa. That's a good point. We're gonna flip it over really quick to Julie and then Tracy, you're up with your pitch. So go ahead, Julie, if you wanna jump in on that one. I was just going to say, you know, the challenge is that laws are national and local and the internet is global. Um, Moya, you're uh, aware that we just issued um, a number of uh, mandatory codes and are working on standards that will apply to eight different sectors of the technology industry. Um, this has to do with illegal and harmful content, uh, specifically child sexual abuse material and terrorist and violent extremist content. Um, but it isn't very easy for these global technology companies to sort of quarantine their activities just to Australia. Um, and that applies to safety as well. So the hope is as, you know, and like the, the European uh, Commission uh, deploying uh, the Digital Services Act and possibly the AI Act, um, as we've seen with GDPR, there should be systemic changes and uh, reforms that happen. But, but again, the, the really important thing in bringing different countries together with different needs, different levels of resourcing and funding, and even different, different political systems and approaches to regulation is gonna be challenging. And one of the reasons we set up this global network is to prevent a splinter net so that countries coming on board can learn from what is best practice. You know, we did not have a playbook uh, we had to write it as we went along, and we're happy to share those learnings. Um, and there will be others who will engage and will try something different that will be successful. So again, it, it has to be a whole of society um, approach to tackling this. Absolutely. Um, so Tracy, you have ironically like a tweet level, because we have less than a minute and we're going to try to get around. So Tracy, then Fernanda, what's the pitch for everybody here? 
I actually want to comment on the regulation side, which is that regulation can also create the space for more solutions. So it doesn't just have to be about the content or behaviors that are happening. The reason why Block Party had to shut down our classic product on Twitter was that there was no openness in the APIs, these programming interfaces. And what regulation can do here is require that openness such that we can have these consumer solutions. There's a bill in the New York State Senate was introduced this legislative session as 6686, which introduces this concept. So just want to put that pitch out there for on the regulation side, what we can do. The other one line pitch is um, Walk Party has a new product called Privacy Party, and this is making it so that we are teaching people what they should do to be safe online and also helping to automate that. So we have automated playbooks for you to lock down your social media settings, check it out, um, give us feedback, and we want to keep building these tools to help keep people safe. Thank you so much, Tracy. And Fernanda, last word. Um, I think the next step is to change the way that we are looking at indigenous women, black people, and LGBTQI plus community, because we are uh, we have been seen as a problem uh, to, to solve, but we are part of the solution. So we need to be included. The digital rights field need to be included, uh, these people, these communities, to solve the problem together. Absolutely, and I would also say none of us have mentioned it, but we need more male allies. So any of you who are out there, we need men in all of these companies, in government, in civil society, joining us in this conversation. So we hope to see, that's a mantle I would take. Um, so thank you all for joining us today. Have a great RightsCon. Really appreciate you, everyone being so brave to share your individual stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.